All right, everybody, welcome this morning. We're going to go ahead and get... It just started snowing. Is that the piano channel? No? Okay, now we're going to start.
I speak, I speak your anointing. Lord, I, I just ask that right now you bring release over everything we do. And that when we're done here, we know you a little bit better. And our lives are a whole lot different because of your presence. We love you, Jesus. Amen.
word it, but it really I, we, we we so often in church circles you know we sing it with a reverence and an awe and a respect and, and that ought to be so but it's also really a word of celebration it's a really a word of rejoicing it's really a word of, of in, in the Hebrew world it was a word that said I have so much inside of me I need to express I don't even know what to say so I'll just say hallelujah it's a really cool word and we do it Throughout our culture, whether whether you believe in God or not, we, we hear that word throughout our culture. Something minor will happen, like I saved a few dollars shopping today, and somebody will go, well, hallelujah. Or something huge will happen, like a miracle in our life, a healing from cancer. And, well, hallelujah. It's a celebration word. And that's really what we want to do at Midtown, is celebrate who Jesus is and what he does in each of our lives. And no matter where you are on that journey, I'll bet you have reason to celebrate. I'll bet there's a hallelujah in your life right now that, that would absolutely be reasonable to stop and focus on that for a minute. So I just want to pray over you for a moment. Before we do anything else in our service, 
that maybe this morning we would take, we'd be able to recognize that hallelujah in our lives. We'd be able to hold to it. And we really would be able to say thank you for whatever that, that moment is. Father, right now I, I do pray over this, this, this entire family of Midtown that we would stop and, and say, oh, that's a moment. That's a hallelujah right there. That's a life-changing sequence, or, or that's a minor breakthrough, but I'm going to celebrate it. I'm going to celebrate the small and the large. And I just pray right now, you'll take blinders off of our eyes, no matter where we are in life, you'll remove blinders from our eyes, and we'll see those hallelujah moments that, that you so quickly and perfectly place in our lives. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. This morning we are kind of celebrating a little bit something different. Ryan, if you'll come up here before we transition at all. Leadership and any 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 children, I want you to come up. Ryan has been serving our children's ministry for the last almost three years. Uh, Ryan gave his heart to the Lord through the family of Midtown and and uh, and He's just, he's grown up here spiritually and he's been serving in our children's ministry. Well, uh, Ryan went and met a girl. They ruined everything. So Ryan's getting married soon. And so he is transitioning out of our children's ministry. And, and Amy McGee is, has taken it over. In fact, she's in there serving today. And we're going to have a celebration service with her uh, when she's not serving. But she's, she's carrying the load today so that we can... We could pray over Ryan and thank him for his faithful servanthood to Midtown Church and for his future. He's he's still going to be in Missoula, but he and his bride to be have got a great future in the Lord, and some doors are opening that they need to step through. And uh, so we just want to bless him and and speak favor over Ryan and and congratulate him and and, and the favor that's that's in his life right now. So Father, we just right now. We just speak a supernatural anointing over Ryan. And I thank you for his servanthood. I thank you for his commitment to Midtown Church. I thank you that, that your grace has, has changed his life. And I thank you that his gifting has risen to the surface and that we've all got to see it here. And so, Lord, we just today re release him into your, your call that for the next chapter of his life. We trust you for what you're doing with Ryan. And, and, and the, all the doors that are opening up right now, so clearly your hand is on his life. I thank you for his investment in the next generation, and that those children have, have a stronger foundation because of the, the time and the energy and the sacrifice that he's put into their lives. So Lord, we speak favor over Ryan and supernatural grace over him, and that no matter what he does from here, that your hand is upon him, and that his eyes are on you, and that his path is broad, and that he's able to walk exactly the destiny you have for him. So we thank you for this opportunity and thank you for his, his love for you more than anything. Thank you that Ryan loves Jesus. And we just speak over him grace and favor in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Will you guys give him a hand as he goes back to his seat? He has served so well. And we are so blessed to have him. In fact, will you do me a favor? Will you stand up and we just greet someone? Tell them you're glad they're here and, and love on them and speak favor over them. Welcome to Midtown Church. Uh, we are just blessed that you've chosen to, uh, to join us this morning uh, on this, this weekend day and the spring weather and, and the busyness of life that, that you would take some time to, to join us. We're just blessed and honored to have you here. Um, we want to welcome all of you, but we especially want to welcome uh, our guests, those that are here for the first time or, or just started to join us recently. Uh, we're just blessed and honored that you would uh, you'd venture out and, and see what this place is about. And, 
uh, and join us as we, we seek Jesus. If you are new around here, um, we would ask you, if you would do us a favor, there should be a card that looks like this in the chair pocket in front of you. Um, if you would take a moment, uh, and, and if you could today, if you got a pen on you, if not, wait till next week. Uh, but if you could, would you take this out and uh, just take a moment to fill out the information on the inside. And in a moment, we're going to pass the offering, and uh, you can just drop it in there. We'd be blessed to have a record of your attendance, and, and as, a, as a staff, pray for you this week. And uh, thank you again for, for joining us. Um, we, we here at Midtown, we, we, believe, uh, we believe what the Bible says is true. And when it asks us to do something, we want to honor it. We don't just want to be hearers of the word, uh, but we want to be doers of the word. Uh, too often, uh, religion is, is hearing and believing something and, and, and not fulfilling it in, in our daily lives and, and living out what the good news of the gospel is. And we want to be people that don't just hear and observe and agree, but actually live out what scripture says. In regards to our, our, our finances, there's a whole lot that the Bible teaches about finances, uh, and, and we believe all of it. But uh, we, we believe that a, a part of our finances is, is the tithes and the offering, the giving to the church, uh, the supporting the work of God and the kingdom of God in, in the local church. And uh, we, we every week give an opportunity to respond to God, to, to worship, to express our love and, and our thanks and our obedience to Him through our giving financially. Uh, it's one aspect of our, our service to Him. It's one aspect of, of the teachings of the Bible that we hold to here at Midtown. And so as, uh, as our ushers get ready, they're going to come forward with some buckets. Uh, we're going to pray, and we're going to give an opportunity to, to respond in this way uh, in our finances. Again, if, if you filled out a, a card, would you drop it in this bucket in the next few moments? Uh, but let's bow our heads and pray before we give to the Lord. Father, we love you. We thank you uh, that you've given us your word. You've given us the Bible. We want to be believers that uh, do what it says in every aspect, financially and every other way. We pray that this morning uh, that we would respond to you, that this wouldn't just be religion or duty or obligation, but this would be an opportunity to respond in our love and our adoration and our worship of you. And we would do that uh, in every aspect of our lives, but right now in, in a financial way. We thank you that you've chosen us to be a part of a church, a part of a body, a part of your kingdom being advanced on this earth. We want to obey you and honor you and we give to you this morning with hearts of worship and gratitude. We love you. It's your name we pray. Amen. I love you, Lord, my strength.
Good morning. Uh, Financial Peace University uh, is, a, is a class we offer here at Midtown Church, uh, which is a phenomenal life-changing class when it comes to how do you handle your fan finances and, and learning how to handle them the way God intended for it to be. Uh, this Wednesday night at 7 o'clock, we're kicking off a new Financial Peace University uh, right here at 7 p.m. Uh, would love to have you join us if you've never been, been through the course. Um, we just wrapped up a course just this last week, and uh, I had a couple people email, this, email me this week and wanted to share with you uh, what they said about Financial Peace University. Um, Today is our 90th day, and we have paid off $5,089.56 in debt and have saved $1,000 cash. We have paid off all of our credit cards, and we'll be making our last car payment this Friday, which was two days ago. The only mountain we have left is our student loans. I highly recommend it, FPU to everyone. Um, a lot of feedback here. I don't know if it's I'll move out here. Um, secondly, I had another email. Um, someone who attended our class said, we found if you do all the steps Dave Ramsey teaches and the order he teaches, the results will be far better than what he claims. We did and we want to share it with everyone. This class is for everyone from the financially secure to the financially distressed. And this class that just wrapped up, um, in a nine week period, uh, we saw over $85,000 in debt paid off and uh, nearly $45,000 in cash saved. With, uh, that's a $130,000 turnaround in just nine weeks. Um, just by learning how to budget, learning how to eliminate debt, learning how to live life with a plan. And I think what's, what's even a greater story is not so much the financial aspect and people being debt free is that there is hope, the, the hope. Maybe, uh, maybe you're in a place where you're just so financially distressed that you're, you're stressed, you're, your performance at your job is down because you don't have a plan, you don't have somebody there walking alongside you helping you through this. And that's what Financial Peace University is. It creates a game plan to offer hope and to, to give you a step-by-step -step, uh, process on how to be f financially secure. So highly recommend uh, you join us Wednesday night, 7 o'clock. Um, after the service, I will be out at the Welcome Center. would love to answer any questions and give you more details on what Financial Peace University is and what uh, that can look like for you. Uh, real quickly, uh, tonight at 6 p.m., we have the honor of uh, having a guest speaker here, Dennis Rainier. Um, if you have questions regarding prophecy, this is killing me, um, regarding prophecy, revival, um, what that is, what that means, is it relevant for today? Uh, service right here, 6 o'clock tonight, going to have some intense, uh, just some great worship with Peter and the team, and uh, get to hear from Dennis as he talks about prophecy and what that looks like in today's day and age. Um, also, out at the Welcome Center, we have a, uh, a sign-up sheet for our, our mid-kids, our children's ministry. If you are interested in being involved in that, we would like to have you sign up, um, help teach. We're looking for a minimum of five people just to step up and say, hey, I can help uh, with mid-kids, mid-kids junior. Next week, following the service, there's going to be a brief meeting with those individuals who want to be involved with, with Amy. And... Um, so please be sure to sign up today, and uh, we'll get you more details. And then finally, our growth groups are uh, up and running. Sound like we had a great, uh, great uh, kickoff last Wednesday night. If you are not involved in a, a growth group, our small group ministry, please be sure to check out the Welcome Center as well and uh, sign up for one of those. But uh, hope to see you guys here tonight, six o'clock or Wednesday. Uh, be sure you're in a growth group, and if not, be here for Financial Peace University. If you will, please direct your attention to the screen here for. Uh, one short video. Let's eat, Grandma. But dinner's not ready yet. Am I, am I? I'm not getting feedback. Good. Good morning. Hey, we're excited about the series called Punctuation, and uh, we're glad that you're here. And we just want you to know that at Midtown, uh, you know, I've said it a couple times, but we really want to be a, a church that's about 
uh, allowing people to investigate a relationship with Jesus. And sometimes what drives us to investigate that is changes in our lives, things that happen in our lives that are unexpected or things that happen in our lives that we don't really know what to do with and, and they seem bigger than us. And, and so we always want to be about engaging the unchurched and allowing, allowing the, the opportunity to just investigate what that walk looks like. And today is our, on our series of punctuation. Last week we started on punctuation and we talked about the question mark in punctuation. And, and today um, I want to talk about just another part of punctuation, the comma. And uh, Jamie, will you come up here? Um, I've, asked, I've asked Jamie uh, Taylor if she would share uh, about her life, uh, just a, a window into her life. And I would encourage you that what you're about to hear is really just a, a slice of just really a cool story. And I would invite you to get to know Justin and Jamie and go to have lunch with them or have coffee with them and, and really hear the, the journey that God's taken them on. But Jamie, just share a little bit about your story, will you? Hi. Feedback. All right, I'm Jamie, and I've been asked to share a little bit. Um, I don't know where to start, really. I guess I come from a divorced family. My dad was an alcoholic, um, so with that, we were in and out of church a lot. Nothing ever was a home. And there you go. All right. There. And so, in when I was a sophomore in high school, I finally found my own youth group. I was able to drive, get myself to and from. And that's kind of where my life started with God and when I was in high school. Then about three years, kind of went back and forth when I graduated. About three years later, after I graduated, I went to Phoenix. And that's where I met somebody by the name of Michael. And we had moved in together, and about a year after that, I found out I was pregnant. Um, he was an alcoholic, and so I had this, felt like a pa pattern of... My dad was an alcoholic, now I've met somebody else that's an alcoholic, and I was like, why is God doing this? I was pregnant, and that's when abuse started, and I was physically abused. Um, up until my son was about a year and a half old, it happened. Um, he was with my kid in his arms the whole time. So it was really awful. I was homeless, actually. I got kicked out of my house, was living in and out of my car, friends' houses for about three to four weeks. And this whole time, I'm like, if God is real, why is he doing this to me? What's, you know, why can't I just have a normal life? And uh, finally, my um, parents were like, that's enough. You're coming home. All of my family's in Montana. And so when I got home, it kind of just was a big full circle. I met somebody a few months later who's now my husband, who has a very similar story. And I look back and really the only person, the only one that was there for me in the times that I'm in my car with my son wondering what's going on was God. Hmm. He never let me down. He was, even though I was homeless per se, I always was provided for. He always was there for me. Hmm. And now I've just found a, you know, church family that's brought me even closer to God. And I just look back and I have no regrets because God has provided for me. He's given me the strength to be able to help other people, other women in this situation of abuse and that you can get through it Amen. and God will always be there for you. Amen. 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 Thank you, Jamie. Amen. Amen. I appreciate it. It takes a lot of courage to get up and kind of tell that story. But just like Jamie said, sometimes life presents us with challenges where we wonder where God is. We, we wonder if he's really involved. And, and really that's what this series is about. This the punctuation that, that will help give us hope, that will encourage us, uh, that, that we'll know we're not alone, as, as Jamie talked about, that, that, that you're part of something bigger than yourself and, and that you don't have to give up when you feel like you want to give up. And, and sometimes it's a, it's a major thing and sometimes it's a minor thing. But just to kind of, again, help you to draw a, a picture, there was a, there was a time when... when, uh, when my, my two oldest boys, Brandon and Kyle, were, were young, and, and, and Tracy was working nights, and I was home, and, and she, she, I, she would leave, and I, I would get home, and so she would leave me instructions on how to cook, and as you know, it, 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 it's just a disaster, um, and, and she left me these instructions this one night, she left some casserole, which I didn't even know what it was, what casserole was, that's a new word to me, but there was this casserole left on the counter, with this, with 
the saran wrap on it and a note that said, here's how to cook it. And so it says, put it in the oven at 325 degrees. And so I put it in the oven at 325 degrees and I'm partying because, you know, dad is cooking. Dad, dad is, we're cooking. And, you know, Park, Brandon and Kyle are little, hey, dad's cooking. We're cooking. I'm cooking. And about a half hour later, it was still not cooked. It was still cold. So I called Tracy and said, hey, what's up? Like, I put it on 325 and put it in the oven and it's still cold. And, and she said, well, did you turn the other knob to bake? Well, that wasn't on the instructions. So, <laughs> so I turned the other button to bake. And uh, now we're really partying because we can see the little thing on the bottom getting red. So we're, now it's hot. We're cooking. Dad's cooking. We're celebrating. Woo-hoo! Dad is cooking tonight. And then this terrible thing happened. The house began to fill with this smell. Um, because the instructions also did not say to remove the saran wrap. But yeah, you know the outcome. And, and so, so all of a sudden, when we think we're doing really well, uh, we, we got this comma in life. And, and whether it's, it's large or small, God throws these commas or allows these commas or, or we create these commas in our lives uh, that, that, that really do impact us. And, and today I want to take just a short time and, and look at a guy in the Bible, uh, in the Old Testament, a guy named Daniel. In the, in the book of Daniel, if, if you have your Bibles, you can turn them on or open them up or whatever form you might have. And if you don't have your Bible, we're going to have it up on the screen. But this guy Daniel, Daniel uh, chapter 1, uh, is, we're just going to pick up kind of at the beginning of his story. And, and, and it says, Daniel chapter 1 verse 3, Then the king commanded this guy named Ash, Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel. We're going to jump to verse 4. He, to, he told him to bring youths with blemish, or without blemish, of good appearance and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, competent to stand in the king's palace, and to teach them the literature and the language of the Chaldeans. We jump to verse 6. Among these were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah. And the chief of the eunuchs gave them names. He gave them new names. Daniel he called Belteshazzar. Hananiah he called Shadrach and Mishael. He called Meshach. And Azariah he called Abednego. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food. See, sometimes we can go through life and life can go smooth and life can go well and it's really, it, it's really not hard to believe God is good. It's really not hard to believe God's, God's for us in those seasons of life where, where things are, are going well. But, but, but when life takes a turn or something devastating happens we, and we find ourselves asking God, how could you allow this? And, 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 or, or how could I be in this position? Or, or why do I feel so rejected? And if you've ever asked yourself, yourself those questions, then you can empathize with Daniel. You, you, can, you could feel what, what Daniel's going through. In fact, all across the pages of Daniel's life, if, if you look all across the pages, there's one big idea. As we look about this, look at Daniel's life, I want you just to get one big idea about Daniel's life. All through his life, there's one statement. God is good even when life is not. I, just wanted, I want you to take that home with you today. Listen, God is good even when life is not. We've all, we've all had those those challenges, and, and sometimes we don't even realize it, but God is directing our lives, and he was directing Daniel's life all through Daniel's life. And just, just, let, me, just let me quickly summarize what happened in Daniel's life, just so we get a, perhaps a modern-day picture and not just read uh, uh, in the Bible and some names that we have a hard time pronouncing. Daniel was a teenage boy. He was about 15, 16 years old, and, and the king at the time, king sent out and said to his, to his chief eunuch, he said, I want you to go and gather all the buff, young man, handsome, tanned, intelligent, tall, dark, square jaw, kind of like every guy in this room, don't you think? Really? So, Dan, so, so the, the, this eunuch was sent out and, and he was to collect, to collect these teenage boys. And they were going to be used as ornaments to decorate the kingdom. Just to, just to stand around the kingdom. And, and so they went and they got the, those, the MVP and the most likely to succeed. And, 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 
and the, the most intelligent, and, and it happened really in today what would be called Kuwait, in the capital city of Kuwait. It was really the area where this was taking place. And, and, and so this unit goes out, and, and he begins to collect all these, these physical specimens, and they're going to take them in, and they're going to they're gonna, they're gonna give them a, fa- a, a new name. They're going to force them to learn a new language. They're going to be ripped away from their family. They're basically going to be prisoners of war, not, be, not because that they were a threat, but just because of who they were, just because of the life that they lived. Now, I imagine that if Daniel made a judgment on what God looked like or what God's attitude was, if he made that decision based on that circumstance of when he was taken captive, I think he'd have a really skewed view of who God is. I, 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 think, I think he'd be disillusioned and confused and, and not really know the real, the real God that's out there. He, he's completely kidnapped. He, he's forced into slavery. Theologians believe that he, was, he, was, he also was made a eunuch. He, he was castrated and, and made neutral. See, eunuchs, eunuchs couldn't reproduce. They, the, that was one of the ways that you could, in that day, create servanthood and create slaves was, was to bring people in and, 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 and castrate, and they would be unable to reproduce. And if they were unable to reproduce, then they would be unable to overthrow and, and unable to outgrow your population. And, and theologians believe that Daniel probably was uh, castrated at this time. And, and sometimes in life, you know, let, let's get past the physical of that. Sometimes in life, I don't know about you, but when I find those times in life where, where we make the statement, God was, life was going good, comma. And when I've had those times in my life, sometimes they paralyze you. That you can't, you can't move forward. You, you don't feel like you can, you can sometimes even get up in the morning. You don't feel like anybody cares. You feel like you're alone. You feel like you're, you're on a squirrel cage of life. You feel like if you take any steps, it's backwards. You feel like you're paralyzed from doing the things you want to do or accomplishing what you, knew you, what you know you need to accomplish. You just want to stay in bed. You hope nobody texts you, emails you, phones you. And if at that moment we decided what God looked like, we'd be disillusioned. We would be wrong in what God really does look like the first big idea I gave you is is that uh, God is good even when life is not but I want you to get another a second I want you to take this home with you as well this is a great great one listen Daniel's eyes were still on God and God's eyes were still on Daniel listen please I, I really want to focus on this for a moment it Sometimes, sometimes we can, we can read through the Bible, and, and, and even if you watch, has anybody been watching the Bible on Sunday nights? They did about a six-week series on Sunday nights. Gosh, that was awesome. I, I absolutely loved it. Uh, we recorded it, and I'm sure I'll watch it again. And, but, but sometimes we can watch that and think that's, that's you know, the made-for-TV kind of story that really happened. But, but what's going on with Daniel's life is not just a made-for-TV movie. This is, this is real deal. This is every detail. The Bible doesn't exaggerate it. It doesn't have to inflate itself. The suffering that he went through, the pain that he went through, but yet he, got, he had success through it. And I believe that, 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 that it help, should give us help to know that, listen, in the firestorms of life, that we, we too can get through. I'm going to believe right now that, that the description, even the little bit that I've shared already, that every one of us in this room that has been through a circumstance, everyone in this room that would be able to say, my life was going good, comma, until, I believe those circumstances have already popped into each one of our minds right now. Maybe your life was going good until certain news came, or your life was going good until something catastrophic happened to somebody you loved. Or your life was going good until you lost your job, or your life is going good until you got a diagnosis from the doctor. Your life was going good until you felt rejected. Well, I just want to tell you something. I believe that you've not gone full circle yet. I believe that, that right in the center of the pain you're feeling, 
right in the core of the stress that you're walking through, right in the center of the questions that you may have, I believe that God is right in the middle of that. I believe that God is right there in the middle of whatever it is that you go through in life. And he doesn't want you to quit. The Bible says in Hebrews that we have a cloud of witnesses cheering us on. We're not living this life alone. We're, we're, there, we're being cheered on by some that have been sold into slavery, some that have been martyred, some that have been hung upside down because they wouldn't be hung the same as Jesus, some that have been rejected, some that have been denied, some that, have, that, have, that, were, that were born with, with less giftings than others, and yet we're being cheered on today because that full circle, because of that full circle. You know, here's what we need to understand is that, is that true gratitude can't be based on our circumstances. We try to fit God into a box. Here's what we try to do. We, say, we make statements like this, maybe not verbally, but inside of our heads and hearts. We say, God is a God of decency and order. And so why should this be happening in my life? And so we make a decision on whether we're happy based on the circumstance of life. Have you ever seen a baby get born? Let's talk about decency and order. And that's God's idea. In the, in, in, just recently with, with our daughter Taylor, she was in the hospital for hours and, and, and in labor for hours and, and in painful, excruciating, screaming, no screaming. They kicked me out of the room. But for hours of work and sweat and pain, what if right in the middle of that we decided whether or not a baby was worth it? But the moment that child's here. So we have to be really careful in wherever we are in life, whether, whether you're in a relationship with Christ or not, whether you, wherever you are in life, we've got to be really careful not to make our decision of our joy or our happiness or our success on that moment's circumstances. We can't do that. We can't do that. And I do promise you, God is so good when life is not good that if you stay, you stay. See, see, Daniel chapter 2 verse 48 says this. This is what happened to Daniel. The king placed Daniel in a high position and lavished many gifts on him. He made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon and placed him in charge of all of his wise men. See, listen, in the middle of the pain, in the middle of the rejection, in the middle of the sorrow, in the middle of all the questions, in the middle of confusion, in the middle of being depressed, in the middle of being discouraged, in the middle of being lied about, in the middle of having his name changed, in the middle of a foreign culture, Daniel stayed true. He stayed true. Because listen, it's not what happens to you, it's what happens through you. Daniel could have started doubting God. Dan Daniel, Daniel could have started accusing God. Daniel could have lost his trust in God. But I want to tell you something. Hebrews 10 says this. Hebrews 10 says, do not throw away your confidence and it will be richly rewarded. Don't lose your confidence in God. Don't, th don't trade your confidence in God in for a circumstance of life. Don't do that. Don't, 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 don't your, your reward, God doesn't lie, and your, your reward, you'll be richly rewarded when you hold your confidence of who God is and how good God is and how much he wants to make a difference in your lives. And how he wants to take you through that circumstance. And how he wants to give you breakthrough. If you'll jump to Daniel chapter 6. Daniel chapter 6. We, we read a little ahead. And, 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 and the, the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego has happened by now. And, and if you're not familiar with that, the, the three boys that got captured with, with da Daniel um, wouldn't bow down. Nebuchadnezzar made a 90-foot statue out of gold. And he said, everybody in the land is going to bow down to me and worship that statue. And so he invited everybody in the land to come to this special day. CNN and TNN and NBC and ABC and Fox News and WGN and KPIX. Fair accurate to the point. They were all there. And it was just big time. And, and when the music starts and the drape drops, everybody's to fall down and worship this 90-foot statue. And those three teenage boys didn't bow down. 
And they gave him a second chance and they still didn't bow down. So he threw him in the fire. And in the middle of their fire, right in the middle of the fire, the very guy that threw them in the fire makes a statement. He says, I thought we threw three men in that fire, but there's four and one of them looks like the Son of God. Because I promise you in the fire of life, in the fire of life is exactly when he shows up and becomes most visible. I promise you. I promise you. So Daniel chapter 6, it says it pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps or, or mares, to, to create uh, 120 mares, and to be over the whole kingdom. And over these three, and over these three governors of whom Daniel was one, that the mares might give account to them so that the king would suffer no loss. Watch this. Then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and all the satraps, or above all the mares, because an excellent spirit was in him. Because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. So the governors and the satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel. Listen, here's what happens here. Daniel became a part of a team. He became a part of a family. He became a part of a church. He became a part of a, a, a workforce. He became a, 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 a part of a, a, a larger group. And, and they were his peers, and, and they were his, his friends, and they were who he hung out with. And those very peers and those very friends and that very family that he was engaged with set him up for failure. I just want to tell you that God knows that sometimes in life it's the people closest to you that hurt you the most. But that doesn't mean that God isn't right there helping you walk through that very close, very deep, very deep pain. Often in tragedy, we ask one of two questions. Why or why not? And most often when we say why not, we say why not somebody else? Why did I get this? Why didn't you give it to them? Let me tell you a story about a man that didn't ask why or why not. There's a guy named Victor Plymeyer. Victor Plymeyer was a missionary. He was a missionary to China and Tibet. Victor went to China in 1908. He served in the, in the Tibetan culture of China for 16 years before one person, he wanted to plant a church, and 16 years before one person came to his service. One Tibetan person. He was in serving in China and Tibet for 19 years, and in the 19th year of serving in, in China and Tibet, his son, his six-year-old son, he had another son, but his six-year-old son and his wife both died of smallpox within one week of each other. So Victor Plymeyer went to the, the, the Chinese or Tibetan government and asked if he could bury his family in their, in their graveyard, and they said, no, you're not a nationalist. No. So Victor took the little bit of money that he had and he bought a small plot of land on the edge outside of the community that they lived in. And it was, it was during the winter time and Victor, Victor this, this story is an amazing story and I promise you that it's completely true. Victor only had the strength to dig one grave. 1920s, early 1930s. He dug one grave and he buried his wife and his six-year-old son in the same grave in that piece of land that he had bought. He continued to serve in China and Tibet and, and he never saw more than a handful of people ever attend his church. Victor Plymeyer died. 65 years after Victor's death, or 65 years after his after his, his wife's death. The church folded once he died, and, and, si and 65 years later, they decided they wanted to restart their church, the small handful of people that had remained over those years. So they went to the, the Tibetan government and asked and said, we'd like to start a church. And, and that government is, is a religious government, but it's, 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 it's a very strong Buddhist government. 
And they said, no, absolutely not, because you don't own any land. So they started going through the records of their, their church, and sure enough, their church had never owned any land. So they contacted Victor's other son, who was still living, a guy named David Plymeyer. And they said, could you look in your dad's records and see if, if our church ever owned anything, if we ever had any buildings, if we ever... And so David went through his dad's records, and no, the church had never owned any land, and they had never owned any buildings. But he found interesting, in his dad's records, he found the deed for the plot of land where David's mother and brother were buried. And the deed was not in the name of Victor Plymeyer. The deed was in the name of the church. So they submitted it to the Tibetan government. And the Tibetan government allowed them to build a church. Today, that original cemetery has been cleared and apartments have been built where it was, where Victor would have buried his wife. But also today on that plot of land stands a church that has 15,000 members that are getting to know Jesus. Victor didn't get to see the why. And God didn't bring sickness on his family. God didn't bring that smallpox onto his wife and child. But in the middle of that circumstance, God found a way to turn life around and impact generations because Victor Plymeyer didn't turn his back on the Lord. He knew he was called to do nothing else but love Jesus and communicate Jesus' love. In Auschwitz, Austria, in the German concentration camp, they found three lines scratched into a wall in one of the cells. This is what they found scratched into a cell. It says, I believe in the sun even when it's not shining. I believe in love even when I don't feel it. And I believe in God even when he's silent. Isn't that amazing? In a German concentration camp. Let me read that to you again. I believe in the sun even when it's not shining. I believe in love even when I don't feel it. I believe in God even when he's silent. Today, I don't know where you are in life, but if you're in a holding pattern of pain, if the commas that come in life has got you paralyzed, I want to pray with you that you'll just be set free from that. See, Psalm 23 says that we're supposed to walk through the valley of shadow of death. We're not to stop and camp out. We're to to walk through it, which means means he he knows that we're, we're on a journey. What's really cool about that is, is, is it says that it's the shadow of the valley. Listen, there can't be a shadow if there's no light. There can't be one. So no matter where you are in life, no matter what comma you're up against today, God is good, even when life is not. Will you bow your heads and pray with me for a moment? Just for a moment. Father, I, I, I pray that I have, I've communicated your heart. I've communicated your word. I, I pray that today I've, I've been obedient in what you once said. And I, I just leave it up to your spirit to do a good work right now. With everyone in the praying mode, with your heads down and your eyes closed, I want to ask two questions. My first question is this. Maybe you don't have a relationship with Jesus today. And maybe you don't have that one, that good God that will walk you through every circumstance of life right in the middle of your life. And today's the day where you need to say, I want to have a relationship with Jesus. I want my life to change. If that's you, I'm going to ask that you would just slip your hand up right where you're at and say, today's the day I make a decision to really give my life. I can't handle these commas on my own anymore. And I need Jesus to be the center of my life. If that's you, I'm going to wait just a moment and ask you to raise your hand and then we're going to do something else. 
okay? But I'm going to believe everyone in here has a right relationship with Jesus Christ or you're still investigating. The next thing I want to do is this is I want to close the service. If today you are in the middle of a comma, and you know what I mean by that. I've talked long enough. If today you are in the middle of a comma, and you'd like prayer, I'm going to ask you to stand up right where you're at on the count of three so that nobody else would wonder if anyone else is going to stand up. But today you're dealing with a comma. And you just want someone to pray with you. You just want someone to pray with you today. When I say three, I want you to stand, boldly stand. One, two, three. Stand up if you're in a comma today. Amen. 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 Right on. I don't want to make this awkward for anyone, but church, if you're comfortable, I want you to move quickly to someone that's standing and pray with them right now. Just look around you. There's people standing all over the building right now. There's six or seven right now. Right now. I need some people back with Kevin and Aaron right now. I need some people with Tom over here on my right. Justin, can I have you pray with Tom right back there? Thank you. Right now. Right now. I want someone praying. And all you got to do is, is, is right now. You may not know what to say, but here's something to say. God, remind him how good you are. God, show him. We're wrapping up a little bit early. I'm going to let Peter take us into a worship song or Amanda. Right now, the band is going to take us. You just pray for that person that God's mercy will come real, will become alive. I'll dismiss in a few minutes. But right now, let's just agree with that person that the comma won't paralyze them.
thank you today for being a part of our weekend experience. And I just pray God's favor on you. You can remain and pray for a while. You're sure invited to do that. Let me just remind you tonight at 6 o'clock is a great opportunity of worship and some teaching. Mid kids. God's, God's calling you to help Amy out. Please sign up at the Welcome Center this morning. God bless you. You're a great family. Have a great Sunday afternoon.